Okay, guys, welcome to our theology uh, discussions here at Castledale Christian Fellowship. Tonight, or today, it depends on when you're watching it, we're going to be discussing uh, the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness. And we're going to be specifically looking at how it teaches or preaches the gospel of Jesus to us. We're going to be looking at uh, various bits and pieces in the tabernacle. Maybe you've never even heard that there is a tabernacle. Well, you're going to hear about it tonight. You're going to understand it a bit better. You're going to understand why God gave it. And we're going to just walk you through the various bits and pieces that are especially relevant. We won't touch every piece, but we'll get through a good bit of it tonight together anyway. We've got John Hewitt here, John, and you're very welcome. So you are. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, John's a tabernacle expert. He's taught us a lot more than I have. That's why I've got John here in to share his wisdom with us all. Uh, if I get stuck, John's going to help me out. You go ahead, John, and introduce yourself and a bit of what I'll going on. introduce myself, firstly, as not a tabernacle expert. I'm an expert in a lot of things. Eating, sleeping, things like that. But not a tabernacle, tabernacle. Uh, I'm from Armagh, and my wife and I were involved in a, a church there. I'm working in our mass, so I, I teach the Bible for a living, and a while ago I did a series um, in our church on the tabernacle, um, so that's probably why I'm here tonight, so I know a little bit more than Mark, maybe, on the tabernacle, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Really and John has kindly brought with him this uh, model, which we're going to be using as, a, as an aid uh, later on as we go through this together. Let's, let's ask the first, really, question, what's our aim tonight? Well, our aim... John, is just to give people a very basic introduction to this thing called the tabernacle. What was the tabernacle? Um, I suppose I'll just throw that out to you. What, what would you say to someone if they've never heard of it, they've never read Exodus, where you can find how it was all given to Moses there, that's where you find the instructions for it. But if they didn't know what this tabernacle was, what would you say to an initial inquirer? Mm. Well, um, the difficulty you have um, tonight or this morning or this evening is <laughs> actually narrowing it down because like anything good it does a number of different things but mm -hmm. the tabernacle was primarily given to the nation of Israel after they had been brought out of Egypt and it was given so that God could dwell in the midst of them so um, Exodus 25 it will say this um, it will say that, that Moses was to make it exactly as the pattern as shown on the mountain but uh, God says this, and let them make me a sanctuary or mm -hmm. tabernacle that I may dwell in their midst. And then you've got another reference there in chapter 26, verse 30, that you shall erect a tabernacle according to the plan that you were shown on the mountain. And he will go on later on to say in, that he may dwell in the midst. So first of all, it was a tent given to Israel that God might dwell in the midst of them. And to teach them some spiritual truths. Absolutely. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. How to approach God? Absolutely. So if you had a child, how would you yes. go about teaching them mathematics? Well, um, my girls really react well if I teach them three sweets. And so what I'll do is I'll have opal, not opal fruits now, they're starburst. I'll have starburst and I'll have four starburst there. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say four and then take away two and then get one of each. Mm -hmm. And then how many does that make? And I'll say two. And we learn, I think, when we're young, we learn through pictures and through symbols and through parables and through types. And this is exactly what this is. This is God's great teaching to, mm -hmm. and God's great parable um, to the nation. And so he's gonna teach them mm -hmm. about who he is, and he's gonna teach them about how to approach him. Yeah, and the thing is that God was very specific that it had to be made the way I'm telling you, Moses. Don't just, do it uh, randomly and make it up as you go along. You've got to follow. God was very specific. You've got to make it the way I've showed you to make it. Because it's, the lessons that it teaches is specific, spiritual truth. We can't, you can't, you couldn't mess around with it and make it shorter or narrower or put the, the vessels anywhere he wanted because the actual uh, altar and the things that we're going to read about now had to be in the exact place because they teach us lessons. Um, I just got a couple of verses here. The tabernacle, Hebrews, the New Testament says that the tabernacle contained copies of heavenly things. It teaches us about things going on in heaven, I suppose, is the easiest way maybe to, to simplify that. And it's also, this is what I'm interested in tonight, especially, it's a shadow of the good things to come. Because the good things to come was Jesus, 
and his gospel and his sacrifice and how he made a way to approach God. Um, it pointed towards Jesus in the gospel and it's a shadow of the good things to come. So it's pointing us towards Jesus. And as a Christian, that's so vitally important because we we're just discussing before, John, mm -hmm. how that as you're reading the Old Testament, it can be in places as dry as dust if we don't see Jesus in it. Absolutely. He makes everything come to light and he makes everything good in our hearts whenever we actually yes. see him and worship him. So that's why this is exciting because Jesus is here. Absolutely. And, and so we're New Testament. This was in the Old Testament yes. uh, before Jesus. And so this will point toward Jesus. Yes. It was a shadow. And there's actually mm -hmm. four words that are used in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. um, one is a type, one is a shadow, one is a layout, and one is a parable. And so this, um, this tabernacle, this picture, this representation will push us toward Jesus in every aspect of it. So just very quickly, show us where... God is in this. Show us where, what, what the, the, okay. the, the aim of what we're doing tonight is bringing people into God's presence. But they've got to know where God's throne is to see how this works. So Absolutely. I'll hand over to you to Absolutely. explain a few things. So at the front here, you do have the door. And you'll notice just on, on the side how beautiful it is. All the different colours. Yeah. Um, and scarlet and purple and blue and white. And this is the one door, as we'll think about, that comes into the, the tabernacle. So you enter by the one door, and the first thing you hit is this brazen um, altar. And this is where the sacrifices would have been um, burnt up. This is where all the burnt offerings and the ascended offerings would have happened. So if a person, for example, would have sinned, they would have brought an animal to the, the door, and they would have lent their hand or lent their weight on the animal and ask God for forgiveness. Um, in God's mind and heart, the sin was transferred onto the animal in some sense, and the animal was taken and killed in their place, and the animal was then taken and put on the altar and burnt up and not ascended um, to God. So this fire was to always be lit, always perpetually be going, and that was the priest's job to do that. Then you move forward to this here laver, it was called. It was just a basin made of, of brass as well. And here it was filled with water. And every time the priest went either to the brazen altar or into the tabernacle proper, they had to go by the labor. So they would have washed their hands and washed their feet every time that they would have went to um, the altar, this altar, this brazen altar, into the tabernacle proper. This was made in two parts. It had a base and then it had a bowl on, on top of it. Then, I'll just take these curtains back of all these different types of curtains. and um, I'll not worry too much about this um, tonight. I'll just take this back. Because you have the second door here. Um, so you've got the first door, and then you've got the second door, or screen as it's called. And I'll just lift that away so you can actually see in. And as you walk in, you to the right, you would have had this here. I'll just set this out here so you can see a bit better. And this was at the table of showbread, 12 loaves of bread on it. And then to the left of you, you would have had the... Um, lampstand. The lampstand. <laughs> <laughs> the lampstand, absolutely, to be perpetually lit. And then you'd have had in front of you, you'd have had the altar of incense. And they would have all sat um, like that in the holy place. So this here is the tabernacle proper, and it was split into two. The holy place, and then behind this veil, you have the most holy place, the holiest of all. And in that place, this would have sat. And this was the Ark of the Covenant, a kind of a box overlaid with gold, with three things in it, the law, the manna, and the rod that budded for Aaron. The actual tablets that God gave to Moses mm -hmm was placed in there, representing the law. And what did this symbolize, this ark, John? And what did it symbolize to us? What did it symbolize? What did God say it was to symbolize? We're together, these, in the in book of Samuel, you read that God actually sat, God actually dwelt between the cherubim. His throne. His throne. His presence. This is where God <clears throat> dwelt uniquely, and this is where God grew yeah. from in that sense. Yeah. Um, and so that, this here, was off bounds to uh, 
pretty much everyone apart from this guy here once he is was the high priest you have other priests in their normal garbs their linen garbs and once a year this man the, the high priest he would have offered up a sacrifice and taken the blood and once a year only he would have went through the field yeah. and he would have sprinkled the blood on this year called the mercy seat and he would have sprinkled the blood seven times he would have sprinkled the blood mm -hmm. and god said that when i see the blood i will there i will meet with you and that is a powerful thing because this is god saying that he is presence in himself here among his people among his people now for tonight's purposes what we're going to do is we're going to say give me that there just one mm -hmm. second john thank you sure. this is where god is yes he's in the air he's in the most holy place how do we get to God? How do we approach God? Isn't that it, John? That's it. So we're going to make a line through. We're going to come through gate, altar, lever of washing. And we're going to come right in then through into the holy place and the most holy place. But the, the lesson is that this is preaching that we're going to uh, really discuss tonight is God's here. How do you approach a holy God? That's what we're going to be looking at together tonight. Is that right? Have you anything to add? Absolutely. Like the book of Acts is actually um, amplifies this. So if you think back to the burning bush, God said for Moses to approach, but approach in my way. Yeah. Take your shoes off your feet. And then you move forward in the book of Exodus to chapter 19, Mount Sinai, where God comes down and he says, approach in this way, only this far. Mm -hmm. And then you move forward where Moses actually gets to look at God, his, his hinder parts, and he says, approach me, but in this way. And he hides him in the cleft of the rock. And here God says, approach me, yes. but in this way. So we can't just walk into God's presence. Absolutely not. We can't just stand her in Absolutely not. Absolutely as we are. Something has to happen. Has well, to let's happen. discuss that. That's what the tabernacle is going to help us tonight to understand the gospel a bit better. The first thing that I want to discuss, John, is these white curtains. This, this um, I suppose, the outer wall, if you call it that. Um, and what this teaches, well, I believe it teaches us, is that the first thing is we're separated. Yeah. It's a separation that's keeping people, humans out, God's in there in the most holy place, mm -hmm. and there's a barrier. Yeah. Curtains obviously act as a general barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree with that? So in the grounds of the tabernacle, this yeah. was holy. Yes. Outside was calm or unclean. Inside clean, outside unclean. Separated. And separated by a fine fine linen that was called, not just linen that you could see through, but mm -hmm. fine linen that you couldn't see through. A, a wall big enough that you couldn't jump over, so there was mm -hmm. no back door in here mm -hmm. at all. This is God's statement, holy. Yes. And it would have actually stood out amongst it, because the nation of Israel would have camped around, God That's would have right. been right in the middle, and so the nation of Israel would have camped around, and they would have all had like badger skin, mm -hmm. um, tents, and all brown tents, and this would have stood out. So even the location of the tabernacle in the middle of the camp, it would preach to us a lesson too. We'd just say, is God at the center of your life? Is God at the center of your camp? Absolutely. Do you live for God? Do you look towards God when you wake up and when you go to bed? All of that there, even by the location of this whole system, Absolutely. right in the middle of the, the, the tents of Israel, uh, preaches at those. But here's the thing, look, the people are on the outside and here's the thing, we stressed it before, but we'll say it again, we don't have access to God. We don't. God is holy. And this is what, like, this is the first lesson that Israel and we must learn. Sin separates us. Sin separates us. So, right at, if you look at the three different rooms, mm -hmm. so you've got the holiest of all, the holy place, and then the outer court. And each of these rooms will preach to us. Mm -hmm. And they will say that God is holy, holy, holy. Amen. So right at the, remember right in the, in the ark, you have the table of the law. Yes. God's commandments, God's saying that he is moral, God's saying that this universe that I have created works in my way, my moral way. Yeah. So God is a God of law. Secondly, you have the lampstand that I couldn't remember, and mm -hmm. the lampstand give out light. And light through the Bible is a symbol of righteousness, of holiness, yes. of goodness. God is light and in him there is no darkness, no darkness at all, says the Apostle at John. All. Absolutely. And so God is holy. God is holy, and then God is 
holy. Yeah. The fine linen. And so the whole way through this tabernacle, God is teaching not only Israel back then, but now us, mm -hmm. that he is holy, holy, holy. But mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. we are sinful. Yes. Sinful, sinful, because we... You could add on another few sinfuls. <laughs> <laughs> you For me, anyway, I don't know about you. Right, the teacher said that some phrase mark. Oh, yeah, yeah. So God, God is holy, holy, holy. And we are sinful because we have broken yeah. his law. Yes. We are sinful because we walk in darkness. Mm. And we are sinful because we are defiled and we need cleansed. That's very good. That's and good. there are three actually different levels of what sin is. Yes. If you want to talk about that with Tom. But my point is that this is the first great lesson yeah. that Israel would have known that God is holy. And if we want to approach him, there is a way to approach him. Yeah, we're going to come on to that now. So the big gospel idea from the curtains, because this is our first uh, piece of the tabernacle that we want to explore. The big gospel idea is that we we, uh, we lost access to God's immediate presence through sin. Okay, As humans, we're born in sin, we've got a sin nature, and we need our sin dealt with if we're going to come into God's presence. Sin separates us from God, sin destroys our relationship with God, it actually destroys our relationship with others very often, and sin actually destroyed, we won't get into it, our relationship with the whole creation when, when man fell. Um, that's another story. But Isaiah 59 and 2, this is a verse I just wanted to raise, is to say, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Here's, here's evidence from the Bible that says sin separates us. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Or it's your sins that have cut you off from God, says another translation. Or your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Or your iniquities have built barriers, like the curtains here, between you and your God. I think that's exactly what this is preaching to us here. But it raises a question. What's the problem with sin? Why is God such a stickler when it comes to sin? Why is it such an issue anyway? Can we not just get on with this and let us in, God? What, what way would you approach that, John? Well, I'll approach it on these three levels. Holiness of God. So, like, I, I think we don't understand a lot of the time how damaging sin is. Okay. So God, God is offended by our sin. Let's get that. So like, let's start in His presence, where mm -hmm. God is, and there's the law, the Ten Commandments. Yes. And God is given a law that runs right through this universe, because God is moral, God is good, God is interested in this universe. Mm -hmm. And if we step out of line, we go against His moral law. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, law, or sorry, sin is breaking God's law. Not as serious. Be because the law reflects God's character and God's nature himself. It's, it's like an attack. Absolutely. If you if you break his law, it's like an attack on his very nature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God. God has made this universe to work in a certain way. Yeah. And if we if we step out of line of that, mm -hmm. we're stepping out of line of God. Mm -hmm. And so the first reason why sin is so important is because it, it's an attack on God. It's breaking his law. Yeah. So you imagine a king making a law in the land and all of his subjects know it. Yeah. And a, a boy steps up and he breaks that law. It's an offense against the king. Mm -hmm. He just sticks your two fingers up at the king and says, I'm not going to obey what you say. So, you have so, no right over me. Absolutely. That's total rebellion. So, so God must judge sin. God must. He must judge sin if he is good. He yeah. must judge sin. Yeah. Um, we don't like thinking about this, but it is a, a real fact. Yes. Well, do you know what? We do like thinking about it, except when it comes to us. Yeah. We want to see other people judged. Yeah. So today, um, I was coming up, I was actually going to collect the tabernacle, and there was a guy come up, and it was the worst driving move I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Like, the guy was an absolute jack of lad. And it annoyed me, and boy, I wanted him judged then, Mark. Where's the place when you need them? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, in hindsight, maybe I wasn't faultless, and maybe I should, but I don't want to think about that. You know, I yeah. don't think about how bad he is. So we want judgment, except... When it's us. When it's us. So I've just got some notes here to help us think, but why, why, what's all this problem with sin? The problem with sin is that God is, is holy, holy, holy. He's white, hot, holy, as I heard someone say before. Mm. So his holy nature 
and his just nature requires that he judge a sin. That he couldn't just say, it's okay that you raped and abused that person. It's okay that you stole that money. It's okay that you murdered that person. You know, it's okay. If God behaved like that, he wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be good. He wouldn't be just. It would be totally against his nature. And I just made a note here. Think of a court system that refused on that level to punish crime. If someone came before the judge and said, well, your honor, there's a guy here and he's, he's raped, he's abused, he's stolen, and he's murdered people. And the judge says, well, we'll not punish him at all. That, that doesn't matter. We would, we would not think that was a good system. We would not think that that judge was even rational or or good in any level. How much more the judge of all the earth? How can God wink at sin? So God's character, John, means he'll never come to terms, ever, ever come to terms with sin. He'll never accept it or condone it or readjust his character to allow sin to be a part of his creation ultimately. So Habakkuk says, and before we move on to the nice, uh, well, Holiness is a nice aspect of God's character, let's not get that wrong, but love also is a part of God's character. But Habakkuk says in the Old Testament that God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. That's why sin's a problem. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And the Bible in the New Testament says the wages of sin is death, but uh, God is love. Tell us a bit about, well, about before, that. Before, I'll just echo a couple of things if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people would say, oh, sure, we're modern people. Mm -hmm. That was back then. Mm -hmm. This is now. The, the amazing thing about this tabernacle, the way it was built, was that the poles did not go straight into the ground. They were actually on a base of brass, which means that they didn't shift or change with the desert sand. God's holiness never changes. Mm -hmm. And like I, I, I see people bringing in things nowadays and all the rest and because we're modern people yeah and i don't think that's an argument that definitely not an argument you can make from the tabernacle but the second thing i want to say just before we move on is sin is an affront against god of what you've said but sin wrecks us mm -hmm. sin is walking in darkness like having no purpose not being able to, not being able to see past certain things. Mm -hmm. That's what sin is. And like I meet loads of people and they are struggling for purpose in life, but if they would come to the light, if they would come to Jesus, they would realize that there genuinely is purpose in life. But then out here, sin is an absolute killer to the person. And this is what God is getting at with the labor. And we'll get there in a second, but yeah. sin is a killer to you. The person, so Tim Keller wrote a book a while ago called Counterfeit Gods and would recommend it um, to anyone listen. And it was the first book to show me how serious sin was against me. I had been taught from this wee fella that, that God hates sin and sin is an affront against God and that is true. And it's the first thing that we need to realise. But I didn't realise before that how damaging sin was to me. Mm -hmm. That sin can actually warp and change me and actually ruin my character. And so God gives this lesson that we are sinful, sinful, sinful. Not only that we might stand before him blameless because of Christ, but more than that, that we might be changed. And God might save us from the damage of walking out of his way. Mm -hmm. Whenever I lived in, oh, after this, and after this, we'll move on. But whenever I lived in Hammond's Bond, um, me and Ash... That's my wife. We're walking um, along the road and we came out and I walked in a wee bit of sheep poo. And so I obviously looked around and there was a, bit of, there was a sheep. Um, but as, as we walked that way, all you know, there was a, 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 a lorry just came past. And it made me think of what the farmer was doing. The farmer, what he had done was he had hedged the sheep in, fenced the sheep in, but the sheep had broken out and it actually had got into a place of danger. Mm -hmm. And this is what God is teaching us. That God's rules, God's regulations, God's way is a way of keeping us from danger. Mm. And our characters can be warped, our purpose can be lost, and we can stand before God guilty. Mm -hmm. And so God is teaching us that he is holy, 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 and that we are sinful, sinful, sinful. Yeah. Thank you, John. But God is love. Okay. We're separated from God. Uh, we can't just walk into his presence because he's holy, but God is love and therefore there's a gate. Mm -hmm. 
there's a way back. He has made a way for us to enter into his presence. He hasn't just left us on the outside saying, I'm holy, you're not, we can't have anything to do with each other. He, he says, no, make a gate, make a way in here. That's what the gate is um, going to show us. Now, there's a way for us to get behind or beyond the barrier of sin and back into fellowship and relationship with the Holy God. That's what the tabernacle is teaching us. He has provided a gateway into his presence again. And we're going to look, talk about the gate together, and the gate is Jesus. Just to have a spoiler at the <laughs> outset, it's Jesus as the gate. Uh, let's think about the gate. Look, the, there's only one way to God. You'll see it on the PowerPoint. You see the tabernacle there. You see the altar in the foreground and the laver just as very dimly there uh, behind that and then into the tabernacle. But at the front, there's a gate. There's those hanging uh, curtains there. And John can maybe point out to, to you on the tabernacle here in the, in the room. But there's only one way to God, not many. That's what I would say to this preaches. Modern, like we're talking about modern ideas earlier on and uh, current fashionable beliefs that they all ways lead to God. There's many ways to God. Uh, all paths up the mountain take you to the top. So it doesn't matter what way you go, we all get there in the end. You can go the Muslim way, you can go the Christian way, and another guy can go uh, the New Age way or whatever he wants to go or she wants to go. But the tabernacle doesn't say that. The tabernacle that God gave his people preaches to us that there's no side doors, there's no back door, there's only one way back into God's presence. There's not a choice of many doors. That, that, that argument that there's many ways into God, this thing here on the table, it disagrees. God disagrees with that uh, spiritual assertion. That's false. There's only one way to approach God. God has a one-way system in place. There's a one-way system, and you can't get to him any other way, and Jesus is the way. John, there's some verses in the New Testament. Um, I'll let you take the, the, I am the door, if you want to say something about the door, and how Jesus claimed to be the door. And if any man enters by me, he said, I am the door by me, if any man enters, he shall be saved. Yeah, like, like, look at it, it was pretty wide. Yeah. So, um, it was available to people. It was, remember, it wasn't this tabernacle, it wasn't placed away up in the, the mountain. They didn't need to make a pilgrimage to it. Yeah. It was right at the center of the camp. Accessible. It was available, it was open, it was wide. They could come, they if could they come. wanted to come. Absolutely. There's a gate. And it was beautiful. Yeah. And I just made a note here, God is available to everyone. God desires everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what the New Testament says. And anyone can come to the door and through the door. So that's very inclusive because that door exists and it doesn't say keep out anyone. Mm -hmm. a, that door tells us you can come, you've got to come my way, but there is an entrance into my presence and it's available for you. So it's very inclusive. On that regard but then there's a verse that that makes christianity not only christianity is very inclusive in that everyone's invited and there's a door for everyone but then it's say exclusive in another way john because jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me there's only one door yeah well absolutely uh, there is one door but it doesn't rub well with our hearts <laughs> it definitely doesn't um, yeah but i think there's a real misunderstanding like Christianity is exclusive. Like we have to say that there's one door, there's one way through Jesus yeah. Christ. But as you were saying, it's all inclusive to everyone who wants to come. That's right. It's available. It's wide. It's in the middle of the camp. Anyone can come. Because the famous, most famous verse in the Bible is John three sixteen. Absolutely. For God so loved the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are you in the world? God loves you. It doesn't matter where you fall on anything. The, the, the initial, the initial uh, call of the gospel to you is that God loves you. And whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but can have everlasting life. So it's very inclusive. Absolutely. Go on ahead, finish off your thought. Well, like, I think there's a misunderstanding. Because like, sometimes Christians are called to narrow and backward yeah. and bigoted and, and all the rest and saying that there is one way. Whereas a person out there is saying there will always or always. Mm -hmm. But like what I think we need to realize that 
every claim, every mm -hmm. truth claim is exclusive to some sense. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying that all religions are that way, that's still a truth claim. And it's an exclusive one. Mm -hmm. But you are exclusively saying that. So yeah. like the, the idea of inclusive, and you need to get rid of that and you need to actually get through all that and work out which one's true. Yeah. So is Christianity true is the question. Yes. Rather than uh, Christians are this way or that way. Yeah. But then if you narrow it down and you're going to say, well, what about the three, because I was thinking about this today, the three great monotheisms. Yeah. And people would say maybe it's one of them. But you've got to work out which one's true even of them because even in the key areas of Christianity, they'll all disagree. Yeah. So the person of Christ, Islam will say he's a prophet. Judaism will say he's a teacher, but Christianity will say he's the son of God. It's completely different. You've got to work out which one is true. Yeah. In the area of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, Islam will teach that Christ didn't die. Judaism will teach that Christ didn't rise again. But Christianity will mm. teach that, that Jesus did both. You've got to work out which one is true. So Islam teaches that he didn't die. Uh -huh. uh, Judaism says he died and stayed dead. And didn't rise. And, didn't rise. and Christianity teaches that he died for our sins in our place and he rose again from the dead. Absolutely. So if Jesus has risen, Christianity is true. Absolutely. But all of them are different. Yeah, they all cancel each other out. So all ways can't be true Absolutely. simultaneously. That's what you're getting at, That's isn't it? That's what I'm getting at. And yeah. so you've got to work out which one. Is they cancel each other out. Yeah. Absolutely. They cancel each other out. So it's not a case of many ways of them. Yeah, out. that's right. And that's what the early church was preaching in this text before you. You'll see it in the top right-hand corner on the PowerPoint. Uh, Peter was preaching this right at the start of, of the book of Acts. This is the early church when the Holy Spirit fell. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Mm -hmm. There's no other name. No other name. No other name. There's, and then Paul, writing to Timothy, he says another very exclusive comment. He says, there is one God, but there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's what the gate, the one gate into the presence of God here preaches. Let's move on as we come through the gate then, John. Just uh, just yeah. lead us through. So come through the gate, um, um, or if you had realized that you had sinned and you wanted to get right with God, you would have brought an animal a lamb or a bullock or a dove to yeah. the door and what you would have done is again you would have prayed and asked God for forgiveness and then either you or the priest would have then killed the lamb and depending on which type of offering you're offering you might have like uh, put the blood on the horns or against the side or the priest would have done that excuse me the priest would have taken the animal and maybe put the blood on the side but then put the animal on the altar and the animal and the blood, or sorry, the animal would have ascended up um, to God. And so the first step in through the door is dealing with our sin. Yeah. So like whenever you whenever you walk through the door of any house, mm -hmm. what do you have on the ground? Doormat. Doormat. Because Don't ask trick questions. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to get rid of the dirt. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the first thing that we have here. And so the blood there, what does that preach about? The blood is preaching about the blood of Christ. The, uh -huh. the sacrifice that he made on the cross. Absolutely. We have to come to Calvary. Absolutely. We have to come and have a sacrifice for our sins in our place before we can approach, if you, if you draw the line through again, to help people. Mm -hmm. You're yes. coming to approach God. Yeah. You've got to come through the blood aspect. You've got to have a sacrifice given for you. Isn't that it? That's so we have to be cleansed by the blood. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an altar and then the wash basins behind that. That's the wash basin there on the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. But so the altar was a place of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, an animal shed its blood, an innocent animal, um, bore your sins in that way and was given in place for you. Mm -hmm. Substitution. Jesus dying for us. That's, the That's what it preaches, isn't it? Absolutely. Perfect picture of. Oh, well, not a perfect picture, sorry. But it's a good picture of what happened at Calvary. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins. Yes. So as that man took that lamb and prayed and asked God for mm -hmm. forgiveness, his sin was, in God's mind and heart, transferred onto the animal. Yeah. And the animal was taken and the animal died in his place. The animal paid the penalty, took the punishment for the man. The wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. 
So death got transferred onto the animal. Mm -hmm. And the man walked away forgiven. Mm -hmm. With life, the animal died. Yeah. Perfect picture of, sorry, good picture of what happened at Calvary. Jesus dying in our place. Christ died for, for us. our sins. To cleanse us from the penalty or from the guilt of sin. From the guilt of sin. Paying the penalty in full, mm -hmm. enabling us to approach the Holy God. Don't come ignoring the blood. You can't come without the blood. And the, the Bible actually says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Yes. Uh, also, I often think about how gory that was at the entrance of that, of that uh, line into God's presence. Like, sin is serious. You, if you came to the tabernacle, you just see blood and animals. Uh, it was kind of maybe making noise, lots of commotion. Just, it feels like um, it's a serious place to be at that altar. Animals are dying, blood is being shed, sin is serious. This is not something to be messed around with. I think it preaches that to us too. You know, the cost of sin, death, bloodshed. Don't come to me without having a substitutionary death in your place. That's. I'm a tiny as well, yeah. so this, this kind of so, stuff makes me strange. Yeah. But it, it is like, it is that serious. That is the less sin. Yeah, sin is, is serious. But, and you need a substitute. Yeah. And that's what sin will do to you. Mm -hmm. Like that's like if 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 you were, didn't take the substitute, that's what sin would do to you. Sin would wreck you. Sin would yeah. kill you. And the wages of sin is death. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. If Christ hasn't died for you, you're going to pay the penalty yourself. The wages of sin is death. And so that, that yeah. it preaches the seriousness of sin. And it preaches this as well. Yeah. That you can be forgiven. Amen. What the amount of people that I meet that are wrecked with guilt. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they're like the man with the, the bad legs that the four boys take in yeah. Mark 2. Yes. And he, he, he's crippled and he can't move forward in life. And I meet so many people that they can't move forward from something that they have done. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus does with that man is he looks at him and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Mm -hmm. And this is what this preach is. Is that if you're listening to this and you can't move forward, you're crippled crippled with, with guilt. Crippled with guilt. Can't move forward in life. Yeah. And you're just looking for God to, to say to you, son or daughter, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. This is what this preach is. That God offers true and real forgiveness. And mm. listen, it must be God. Yeah. It must be God forgive you. A man or any can't forgive you. It must be God. Yeah. And God preaches through this vessel here that you can be forgiven of your sins because Christ died for your sins. And there's just some verses on screen there for people who want to read them. I'll read one. I'll read Romans 3.25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice. Because that's what happened at that altar. Sacrifice. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. You need to put your faith in the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus for you to be saved. You need to turn away from sin and trust what happened on the cross, it happened for you. And it says that God did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. But he's not going to wipe them under the carpet. Christ paid for them all on the cross. If you will trust him by faith. And I just wanted to say here on the layout here, you come through the gate, you come to the altar, and then we're going to come to the laver and finish uh, with this uh, washing at the laver in a moment. But I just wrote down here... Uh, to look at the layout of the tabernacle, it's, it's almost like God saying this. He said, if you want to come into my presence and live, you can't come just any old way. You can't just walk straight in. It's not safe for you. You need to be cleansed first. Cleansed by the blood and then the water. We're going to talk about that in a moment. You need to be cleansed first. You need to be washed in the blood and washed by water. A sacrifice for sins will be needed before you come in to meet me. It's almost like that's what it's preaching. Oh, absolutely. Maybe not almost. That's exactly what that's preaching. And remember, this was, this was exactly given to Moses on the mountain. Yeah. Like that's, that's the word in, in, in Exodus 25. Exactly yes. as I show you concerning the God is very specific in where he laid these things out. Absolutely. So the last thing is the labor, John, washing with water. Tell us about a bit about that. I've got Titus 3 here up on the screen. If well, you can, labor, as simply as you can, explain the difference between the cleansing by blood and the cleansing by water. So the labor was split into two. Mm -hmm. there was, some translations will say there was a foot or a base, and then there was a bowl on top. 
So there was a, a basic thing, a foundational thing, mm -hmm. and then there was a continual thing. Mm -hmm. And so the Titus 3 on the screen there will help us with this. It says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, I notice this, by the washing of regeneration, regeneration. and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out, water symbolism, yes. poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. So, so the moment the person comes and trusts the Lord Jesus, they are cleansed from their guilt. That's the, that's the Sins point. forgiven. Sins forgiven. Conscience cleansed. But God doesn't want to just hand us a ticket. God wants the change of our life as well. And so we are born again. Regenerated, made new, because new creation, washed. Yeah. So that's the symbol of water. But there's a foundation work. Yes. That's the regeneration, the the making us new again. Mm -hmm. But then there's not only the making us new again, giving us new life, giving yes. us the Holy Spirit. Who is a person? Who is a person? God Himself comes and indwells us, gives us power to live. Gives us power to live over sin. Yes. And then we. Not only do we have that basic work of that, that moment in time whenever we trust the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. and we are born again, receiving the Spirit, but then we have a renewal, a day-by-day -day living. That's what the priests did. They yeah. came, and if they wanted to go to the altar, if they wanted to go into the yes. Lord's presence, they cleansed themselves yes. day by day. And so the Holy Spirit, what he will do through his word, because the water, yes. water is a picture of the word as well. Yes. So through his word and through the spirit, day by day, as a person grows and lives with God, because mm -hmm. that's the point of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. It's not a ticket. It's, it's a living fellowship with God, mm -hmm. right at the center of the camp. Yeah. And as a person lives day by day in the power of the spirit, letting the spirit um, show them the word and they'll giving them the power to obey the word and the desire then they will be yep. cleansed yes from that character remember remember the defilement yes right here and how that can warp our character and so the holy spirit through his word wants to shape us and cleanse us day by day so we get washed when we get saved we get the the once and for all washing okay mm -hmm. we get the holy spirit as a gift and he regenerates us and gives us the life of god um, he gives us eternal life, Absolutely. okay? But then we're not perfect. No. We've got lots of things that need to change. That's right. So that's the continual washing. The continual washing. So as we... So there's a once and for all being born again, yes. regenerated, but then there's a continual process. And to be continually washed, you need to be continually opening your Bible <laughs> and allowing God to speak to you, Absolutely. challenge you, encourage you, lead you, guide you, and submit to what the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit's in us, and He helps us and empowers yeah. us and changes our desires. So there's that continual aspect of being in relationship uh, with over God time. over time. Over yeah. time, you'll see the trajectory of your life go, move towards holiness. That's right. If the Holy Spirit is living in us and allowed to cultivate those amazing fruit of love and goodness and peace and gentleness, that'll start to manifest in our lives. So, so pulling this together a little bit, the gospel of Jesus Christ is here, isn't it? Absolutely. It's saying to us, the gates on the outside again, we're separated from God. We can't get access to him. He's in here. He's in the most holy place. There's one way in through Christ. Yeah. There's a cleansing that you need through Christ, his blood. There's another type of a cleansing that we need. Uh, yep. Yeah. The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, when we receive Christ, we get the Spirit of Christ, and there's an ongoing cleansing in order for us to be really in relationship with God. There's much more we could say about this. There's so many more things we could teach, but I think that's a good um, wrap up. Uh, and we've done, we've accomplished what we wanted to do really at the moment, only to challenge someone to say, Have you got Jesus? Are you able to come into his presence? Do you agree that you are separated from God? Do you agree that sin's a problem in your life? Um, will you come to that one gate? Or are you thinking that there's a, uh, some people say, you know, there might be a back door into heaven or they think that they might have another chance after they die. Really, you need to come to Jesus now when you're alive. You need to come to that gate and come in through and get access. You need to really apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your life. 
You need to receive him as your saviour. He died on the cross for you. He shed his blood to cleanse you from the guilt of sin. If you've got that dark feeling of guilt, Christ can cleanse it. He paid the price on Calvary. And he said, it is finished. He done a complete and total work. Uh, you can't add to it and you can't earn it. And you don't deserve it. It's by grace that we're saved. And it's through faith. It's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And it's not of works lest any of us should boast. Uh, he'll give you his Holy Spirit. You, some people say, if I, got, if I received Jesus as my Savior, and if I applied the blood, I couldn't live this life anyway. And God says, I know you couldn't. That's why the imagery here is of the Holy Spirit being given to you and the water lever being regenerated. He gives you, uh, he comes and he indwells you himself. So God will walk with you and be with you. And he says, I will never leave you or forsake you when you trust my son. And he will strengthen you and empower you to live out this life. And he will enable you eventually to come into God's presence forever, to dwell with him forever. And the final thing that I was thinking about, I know this has gone on a bit, but I think it's too lovely to miss. John, the word became flesh and tabernacle among us. Awesome. Tell us something very, very briefly about the whole thing being in what John said about Jesus. Absolutely. Well, it does. It speaks of Jesus. He, this was a portable tent that yes. walked around. But a portable tent that was the presence of God. And so John looks at Jesus in John 1 mm -hmm. and he says that he tabernacled with us and we saw his glory. Amen. And that's what, that's what all of this will speak to us of Jesus. Whether it's his death, whether it's him pouring out the Holy Spirit, whether it is us having real fellowship and eating with him, whether it is of walking in his light, whether it is his great high priestly ministry, whether it is the rent veil and access in the mm -hmm. God, whether it is his person, his unique, amazing person, or whether it is the mercy seat, the propitiation work of Christ, all of this speaks of him and all of us, all of him, all of this will speak of him. And I would encourage you to study it. Yeah. and to see how Christ dwelt. It is a picture, it is a shadow, it's not perfect, but man oh man. It points it to Jesus, points to, Jesus. It points to the cross. Absolutely, everything about it. So take it, think about it, enjoy it, ask the Lord to help you understand it, and you will really be blessed. You will really be blessed. And I'll just finish with this, that the gate was beautiful, and it drew people in. And the best thing that you can do is you can ask God to show you Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because the more you see Jesus Christ, the more you will see he is beautiful. And that will just draw you in Amen. to God's presence. Thank you, John. Really I think we've, uh, we've done what we need to do and mm -hmm. said what we need to say. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your time. I pray it's been helpful. I pray you've learned something. Uh, if you're a Christian, I hope it's been beneficial to you and built you up in some way. If you're not a Christian and you've got questions, feel free to contact the page even and shoot out a, a question or two. And I'm happy, John's happy, to answer anything you might have further if we can. God bless. Thank you so much.